How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. Well, my royal family, this is going to be a bit of a long video, but I think it's quite necessary and quite ironic to the, the things that are going on in America in regards of, um, you know, the vaccine. All right. Rona is standing strong in America and in other countries. So the propaganda that we've been hearing continuously that, um, you know, we get Rona more disproportionately than anybody on the planet. Okay. So this is the propaganda they're using they need to find, you know, cause th there's nothing that they, in this country that they can do to rectify the continuous atrocious half-ass behavior when we're in the medical industry they question everything about us you know they feel like we can tolerate pain more than anyone on the planet i mean it's ridiculous okay so i had i had did um let me see if it's here did i take it down i think i did anyway i'm gonna just leave it right here for for time being because one of the pictures I wanted to show was the police but y'all got good visual so I'm all for the police throughout America to be the first to be vac vaccinated I I've said that more than once but there is something even greater going on there are now people um, feel like they are entitled to be vaccinated and they really don't want us to be vaccinated and I was like oh damn now there is a unquote uh, dark market on the vaccine alright and I choose to call it the white market so folks is all upset because they didn't when when they started distributing the vaccine um it was done sloppy half ass nor no organization or anything that was done on purpose because of the white market that they run it you know and folks these folks don't fully understand they don't want nobody don't want us to have it we didn't plan on taking the shit overall, but nobody want us to have it. Everybody jockeying for power, and it's all about no, 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 not, not, not them niggas over there. They, they don't get, they get the the scraps. Well, we didn't plan on taking it, but isn't it ironic? It lets you know what space and time we truly continue to be. They really don't want us to take it. I mean, they had a certain benchmark that they were supposed to meet and all these millions and millions of people were supposed to get this. But keep in your frontal lobe, my royal family. Nobody really want us to go get that vaccine because they feel entitled. Like I have said, we have fully came to that full, full circle. It's already met that now Esau is feeling the effects of voting against your interests. Isn't this ironic? Isn't this ironic? So let's go on this journey, my royal family. Let's look at this first video. No, 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 no. You gotta listen to, excuse me, the audio, okay? The audio. It's about four minutes and 52 seconds. Can money buy a COVID vaccine? Here's why some worry rich Americans will cut in line. Doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists across the U.S. have received the first doses of the coronavirus vaccine authorized for emergency use this week. Can the rich buy the next spot in line? I hope not, said Patricia A. Stinchfield, a registered nurse and president of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, during a pointer webinar December 14. I think that we have done a lot of careful work that's evidence-based in deciding who should go first and why they should go first. It's based on risk. But in some ways, 
It's out of doctors and health experts' hands. Many wealthy Americans pay for concierge medical services, a kind of high-quality, primary care most Americans can't afford, the Los Angeles Times reported. Some of those services have already procured the expensive freezers needed to store the vaccine and put their patients on wait lists as soon as it becomes available for widespread distribution. There's also concern over black market dealings, bribery and people fudging their way onto the list of high-risk individuals and essential workers slated to receive the vaccine during the early phases of distribution, Stat News reported. If you have athletes in a state that want to be a strong arm to the state government's leaders and they vow to get it, that's out of our control, Stinchfield said. Just a quick word from our sponsor. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Hip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name and price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous walrus, the bulbous walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. But we hope not. We hope people will have patience. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized the Pfizer vaccine for emergency use last week, and officials are expected to authorize the Moderna vaccine Friday. Healthcare workers and residents and staff at long-term care facilities are first in line to receive the vaccination under recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Essential workers such as firefighters and corrections officers are next, followed by adults with high-risk medical conditions and those over age 65. The CDC's recommendations were based on advice by an outside group of medical experts known as the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. But state health officials will have the ultimate say. What defines an essential worker is up to interpretation by individual state health departments. Guidance from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and executive orders in some states define the predominantly white financial services industry as essential, which could include anyone from a bank teller to a stock market trader, Stat News reported. Florida previously determined world wrestling entertainment was essential and allowed it to continue operating during the pandemic, according to the media outlet, while members of the media have been deemed essential by the state of California because people with underlying health conditions such as smoking or asthma are also eligible for an early dose of the vaccine. Stat News reported there is opportunity for wealthy people and their physicians to fudge the severity of their health conditions. Someone's mild asthma, for example, might be portrayed as severe to guarantee them access to a vaccine. Glenn Ellis, a bioethicist and a visiting scholar at Tuskegee University, told the LA Times the ambiguity in how officials define essential workers and underlying health conditions leaves space for the well-connected to push their way forward. With enough money and influence, you can make a convincing argument about anything, Ellis said, according to the Times. Practitioners at concierge medical services have already heard from patients looking for access. Andrew Olanow, co-founder of the concierge service Solus Health in Beverly Hills, Manhattan and the Hamptons, told Market Watch patients have been questioning him about the vaccine since March. Solus Health charges anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000 a year for one adult depending on the person's age, MarketWatch reported. We'll be working hard to get access to the vaccine for the members of our practice when it becomes available to a certain risk profile, Olanau told the media outlet. My guess is that we, as members of the private sector, will be able to move quicker than the public sector. Cedar sinai Medical Center in Southern California was one of the first hospitals to stock the vaccine, the LA Times reported. Dr. Jeff Toll who has admitting privileges at the hospital, told the Times he had one patient ask, if I'd donate $25,000 to Cedars, would that help me get in line? The answer was no. But that's not something members of a certain class are accustomed to hearing. We get hundreds of calls every single day, said Dr. Asan Ali, who runs Beverly Hills Concierge Doctor, told the LA Times. This is the first time where I have not been able to get something for my patients. Ali's clients pay between $2,000 and $10,000 annually for concierge care. They include singers Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber, the Times reported. But some argue wealth is exactly what should hold them back from cutting in line. They are among the most capable of mitigating the dangers of exposure for themselves, Seamus Khan, a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University, wrote in an opinion piece for the Washington Post. Most can get their groceries delivered without any social contact. They are more likely to work the kinds of jobs that can be performed remotely. When it comes to early access to a vaccine, a chief executive is far less essential than a pharmacy clerk and far less at risk than someone imprisoned and awaiting trial. Next article. Okay, let me shut that down. Dave Barry's year in review. Let me shut that down. 2020 was a year of. Okay. 
So there is a dark market and again and again folks is getting real tired about talking about the royal family disproportionately is getting this. Again, the police feel like they should be first because they out there on the battlefield. Well, help, some healthcare workers feel like they're entitled. And there are some healthcare wor workers say they're not taking it either. But what gets me in the space and time that we are in now is that that market instantly popped up because of entitlement. You literally walking off the cliff. I didn't already play the video of the ingredients in this. This shit will kill you. I mean, just people that are allergic um, to shellfish would exempt you from it. You know, it's the last video I put up my royal family if nobody didn't watch it or anything. But it goes even deeper. Oh yeah, you gotta listen to this. You gotta listen to this. It goes even deeper. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the quarantine report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York City, blanketed in snow um, from this new nor nor'easter, joined remotely by co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Good morning, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Well, as coronavirus infections and deaths continue to shatter world records in the United States, Vaccines are rolling out across the country with health care providers first in line, like respiratory therapist Justina Schubert at the University UW Health in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. It's important because so many people have died from this. And um, I wanted to um, have an impact on my community about this and show them that I'm, play I'm playing my part and getting vaccinated. And I think that um, I want to inspire people, especially the patients that look like me and I take care of every day, that it's okay to get vaccinated, it's safe. And I want to put a name and a face, especially here in Madison, in Wisconsin, that get vaccinated. Meanwhile, in the UK, 84-year-old retired Secretary Maureen Hughes received one of the country's first Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccines and said she now hopes to be able to see family members at Christmas. I, I can't thank people enough that have made this vaccine possible. And uh, when you've been isolating for four or five months, you know, this is the product at the end, you know, or well, the beginning, could be the beginning. And uh, we're just really excited. This comes as health experts are raising concerns that wealthy countries have reserved enough vaccine doses to immunize their populations multiple times over, while poorer countries may only have enough to vaccinate just about 20% of their populations. On Wednesday, Reuters reported the World Health Organization's global plan for delivering COVID-19 vaccines to 91 poor and middle-income countries, mostly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, faces a, quote, very high risk of failure and could leave billions of people with no access to vaccines until as late as 2024. For more, we begin today's show with Dr. Krishna Uday Kumar, founding director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center and principal researcher for their project that's tracking COVID-19 vaccine purchases around the world. He's also a practicing physician at Duke University. Their latest report shows that total worldwide confirmed purchases of COVID-19 vaccines have reached at least 7.25 billion doses with 3.9 billion of those doses, more than half in high-income countries, although these countries comprise just 14% of the world's population. Dr. Udaya Kumar, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. 
Um, why don't you start off by explaining this disparity? Um, and what does it mean that countries hoard vaccines that they haven't even gotten yet uh, to the tune of three times, four times, six times their actual population? Sure, good to be with you today, and thank you for taking on this important topic. What we started to see was a tension where countries are trying to do what's best for their own populations and at the same time trying to be good citizens of the world. And very quickly, as we saw the pandemic worsen in the spring, we had the development of the a COVAX platform, which really brought together the World Health Organization, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, each with areas of expertise. And that together, they created a, a mechanism where the world could come together, figure out how to buy and equitably distribute vaccines around the world. There are now almost 190 countries and participants that have signed on to that model. And yet what we see is that something like 90% of all the vaccine doses that have been purchased have actually been done directly by countries, mostly middle-income and high-income countries, as opposed to low-income countries. Uh, and so while on the one hand we want to come together into this multilateral platform, what we are seeing is uh, a lot of side deals in essence where people are trying to also ensure that they are hedging their bets to make this work. What that means in high-income countries is uh, I don't think anybody is interested in trying to hoard vaccines beyond what they need, but much of these purchases were made before we had any idea of which of these vaccines might work. So countries like the US, Canada, regions like the EU went out and made a portfolio of bets to buy advance uh, purchases of multiple types of vaccines, not knowing if one or more would actually make it through the very rigorous science to be available. And Dr. Odaya Kumar, could you talk about what has been said uh, by these rich countries about what they'll do with all these excess uh, vaccines, uh, vaccine doses, and what countries in the world are being left behind? In other words, what countries are entirely relying on the COVAX facility to get any vaccine? Yeah, we are starting to see positive uh, language from many high-income countries in uh, public statements. Both Canada and uh, the EU, for example, have come out and made clear that if and when they have excess doses available, they en envision making those available for low-income countries. What is less clear is whether those are actually going to go through the COVAX mechanism, or in the case of Europe, it seems like they may bypass COVAX and, and make those donations directly to low-income countries. Now, if the current trend line plays out, what we're gonna see is that most populations in low-income countries are going to be left behind and wait a number of years, two, three, four years before those populations are are really vaccinated at any significant level to achieve herd immunity. Dr. Odeya Kumar, the other vaccines that have not yet been approved from outside uh, the Euro-American world include uh, vaccines for uh, vaccines from China that are in late stage clinical trials, one of which has been approved and is in use in the UAE and Bahrain, uh, as well as the, the, the Russia vaccine. Have you been tracking uh, countries that have pre-purchased these vaccines? We have, to the extent they're publicly available in terms of the information. We do know that um, there are several countries that have made purchases uh, of, the, of various Chinese vaccines. There are several under development. We do know that they have already been used extensively in China, there are public reports that more than a million people in China have been vaccinated with one of the domestically manufactured vaccines, but we don't have clarity as to which ones they may be. What we also don't have clarity on are the real uh, data and evidence behind the particular vaccines from China and from Russia. Uh, what we've seen from the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine, for example, and today uh, at the FDA advisory committee, we'll see from the Moderna vaccine is a very transparent and rigorous process to review and uh, look at all of the primary data to ensure safety and efficacy. 
our hope is that we will set very high regulatory standards for all vaccines that come through, and that's what we envision happening over the coming weeks and months. And in addition to the vaccines being developed in China and Russia, we know that there are others in the late stage of pipeline development that are also very promising. Uh, one developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca, for example, uh, is in late stage testing, and it, when it becomes available, can be scaled up pretty rapidly. And so we're hopeful that that's the type of vaccine that doesn't require ultra cold chain uh, transportation, for example, and storage that will make it much easier to actually distribute and vaccinate in low resource settings. Doctor, could you explain uh, the whole philosophy behind the COVAX facility, what that means, um, and also talk about the People's Vaccine Alliance um, that is challenging trade secrets and patents in this time of pandemic, in this time where so many people are dying around the world? Sure, I think both great questions. First, I think COVAX uh, really serves a purpose in, in developing a, a truly multilateral approach, which is what we need. We have to recognize that this pandemic is global. It, the, uh, you know, co the coronavirus doesn't recognize borders and we can't really function as an economy with closed borders for an extended period of time. So there is a very strong health and economic argument in addition to the ethical and humanitarian argument that high-income countries are better off if we can equitably distribute vaccines around the world. For that purpose, COVAX really brings together complementary capabilities, strong global participation, and yet it has challenges, as you noted earlier in the show, uh, that it's a very high risk of failing from their own internal reports. Uh, it needs to be financed much more aggressively. It needs a very strong ability to purchase and distribute vaccines in the market. Uh, in the midst of not having that in the short term, what we are seeing are mechanisms um, around, including through some development banks. So the World Bank, outside of COVAX, has already pledged $12 billion. What we've seen just in the last few days is that the Asian Development Bank has put another $9 billion on the table, and the Inter-American Development Bank has put a, a billion dollars. So it's great to see those um, the funds becoming available largely directly to countries so that they can not only purchase, but we have to recognize just getting the vaccines is the first step. You have to have the distribution and supply chain. You have to have the health workforce. Uh, you have to have all of the supplies that go with vaccines to make them available for vaccinations. And you've got to have the data and information technology systems to track all this. So actually getting from vaccine in a vial to a jab in an arm is a hugely complex and expensive task, especially in low resource settings. So that's what we also need funding for. Now to the second question about intellectual property, it is a major issue and we've seen that be a major issue in prior health uh, um, in epidemics like HIV. Uh, I'll preface my comments by saying I'm not an expert in, in IP and, uh, and have many colleagues who are much more expert at this. Uh, but what we've seen is a strong recognition of the need for uh, appropriate, equitable global distribution. On the positive side, some of the indications we're seeing is really a ramping up of manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries. Part of the reason India is uh, at a place where they have more than a billion doses potentially coming to their domestic market is because they have the Serum Institute of India that is a very strong domestic producer, but also has become the engine for vaccine manufacturing for the world. They have licensing agreements with the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, for example. We've seen manufacturing become available and ramped up in places like Brazil, in Thailand, in South Africa. We think that's really important to make sure that when vaccine is manufactured in LMIC contacts, low and middle income countries, it becomes much more likely that local and regional populations will get access to those. So that's one trend uh, without dealing particularly with the IP challenge perhaps, uh, but a mechanism through licensing or manufacturing capacity that we are starting to see an uptick in, uh, in availability over time. And uh, Dr. Odeya Kumar, right before we conclude, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which is more suitable for developing countries because it's easier to transport. 
and also that the Serum Institute will be manufacturing it. Do you expect the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine to be more readily available in developing countries also because they've committed a certain percentage of their vaccines to uh, developing countries, which I don't believe either Moderna and Pfizer have, though perhaps uh, at, at this point they, they have? Yeah, you're exactly right. So uh, both India, because of the production at the Serum Institute of India, and COVAX, because of a purchase agreement, uh, will have access to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And because it's a different technology that it's based on relative to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, it also uh, is able to be scaled much more effectively. Uh, the estimates we have is that the manufacturing capacity by the end of 2021 maybe uh, as high as 3 billion doses of that particular vaccine. We are seeing that 2.6 billion uh, doses have already been purchased around the world, including by COVAX, including directly by some middle-income countries like India. Uh, so we do see overall the fantastic news that we are gonna have multiple vaccines available, uh, which would have been unthinkable a year ago uh, or even six months ago. So we should celebrate the feat of science that's gotten us this far, but not lose sight that we have to also think about access and equity to make sure that the science is really paying off for human health. And also, who does the science? You tweeted, um, <clears throat> you know the two awesome vaccines that will tame the pandemic? Pfizer's vaccine developed by two Turkish immigrants, Moderna's vaccine developed by a black woman virologist. Another reason for diversity in STEM, it makes science better. Of course, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You're uh, oh, Without a doubt. Although that actually that's our next um, guest tweet, um, but you can comment on it on what that means. Sure. Without a doubt, I think we. Uh, have to celebrate also the diversity that allows us to bring the best minds uh, and the most diverse perspectives together that allow us to do the best team science. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Krishna Udayakumar, uh, founding director of... Okay, my royal family. So, we see on even a global scale, they had already unquote wealthy countries didn't already put up capital to get this but they making it hard already they ain't even properly here in the United States even got it together because now the wealthy unquote wealthy feel entitled to that you know and they they don't want to keep hearing about that we need to get this you know because we're spreading it all over the damn place you know there's people literally jockeying for this stuff outright poison i was saying to myself i said is there a scripture for that one is there a scripture for that one now isn't that one that one was ironic to me so just gave y'all like a little breakdown of what's going on you know it ain't nothing surprising to the royal family here in america so my royal family render your voice with your beautiful divine words and it's always my royal family I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. And with that said, Ashe. Uh.